But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means of our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss leaders, their decisions, and how they shape the world we live in today. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast. In today's episode, we journey back to the late 18th century, a pivotal period marked by revolution and the birth of a nation. The stage is set in North America, where the seeds of a new republic are being sown. We're talking about the United States on the brink of its inception. Picture a nation striving for independence, led by an extraordinary individual, George Washington, America's first president. He stands before us, ready to make a monumentous decision that will define his legacy and shape the future of his country. We'll chart the course of Washington's unparalleled leadership, his steadfast commitment to his fledgling nation, and his decision to relinquish control of the Continental Army. Join us on a journey filled with lessons in leadership, acts of sacrifice, and the steadfast determination that define this key period in American history. So whether you're a history enthusiast, a student, or simply a curious learner, seeking insights from the past to better understand our present, let's step back in time together and set history in motion. Welcome to the era of George Washington and his defining decision. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the History in Motion podcast. And today we are talking about America's first president, uh, George Washington. And the thing that's super interesting about him and that I'm really excited to talk about is not only did he help found this brand new nation that is radically different than anything existed at the time. One of the things I think, Richie, that we're most excited to talk about today is his decision to give back the Continental Army to Congress. So if we look throughout history, there's so many leaders, specifically generals, who win great wars on behalf of their state. And then they use that as a springboard to take ultimate power, whether it be a dictator or some sort of influential position, where Washington actually gives the army back and takes a step down and says... You know, I'm giving the army back to Congress, who's elected by the people, because that's what we stand for. And I think that's just such a profound moment in history. So I think, Richie, I'm kind of curious to see, like, is this I've always thought of as like one of the most interesting kind of decisions. Um, I don't know how you've come been coming into this, but has this been something that's been on the top of your mind or is this kind of maybe a newer topic for you as well? So my American history is not as good as it should be. I will <laughs> I will admit that at the kickoff of this episode. Um I've always been interested in the founding fathers, George Washington in particular. I think there's this kind of magnetism that exists um, from purely a historical perspective. And then that kind of layer of leadership and how he kind of approached his decision making, I find really interesting and kind of the archetype that he represents this person that's motivated by this high degree of civic duty, loyalty, leadership, this kind of element of service. He's... You know, he's a leader of men and you'll see, you'll see this throughout his bio that he always kind of is finds finds himself in places of leadership, but doesn't necessarily, you know, want it through, you know, his um, ambition, but rather does so out of this kind of sense of civic duty, which I always find super interesting when it comes to these kind of political leaders, right? You know, most politicians are, (laughs) (laughs) might be a little bit more egotistical and want positions of power, you know, for the sake of their own ambition, Whereas with Washington, you know, the, the the takeaway for me has been that he was really motivated by something, you know, much larger than just his personal ambition or drive. You know, he really was committed to this kind of idea of, you know, independent America and that that civic duty that kind of came coupled with that. Yeah, and I think we've talked about this a, f- a bunch of times on you know, the leaders. Are they chosen? Yeah. Do they want to lead? how do they get into this position? And I think Washington is definitely one of those people who there's definitely ambition there for sure. But to your point of, you know, politicians and a little bit of ego, I think he's definitely not on the same level as maybe a lot of these other people. So I think maybe before we get into, you know, Washington himself and all the things that, that he accomplished, we need to kind of set the state of the world at the time. So 
the big thing we when we've talked about in a few other podcasts is the colonial pieces to the British Empire and specifically the Western powers in Europe at the time. So Britain had set up colonies um, along the east coast of America. So think of cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia. These are all huge cities um, that were created from a bunch of different Western European um, explorers and colonists. Um, and then these 13 colonies are set up along the east coast of the United States, spanning all the way up from what was we call today New England and then all the way down to areas around Georgia. So it's basically this entire east coast and is covered by these british colonies but they are so separate from britain really at the time in terms of how they govern themselves and really distance is another thing too um and they almost start to become a little bit self-sufficient um but they're really controlled by the british government so like if you look at transportation for example there's a lot of atlantic trade that's happening into these colonies so we think of like the plantations in the south and a lot of other uh, ex- imports and exports that are coming in, they were controlled um, by the British in the sense that like all transportation had to be done through British ships. Um, the export of raw materials to foreign lands was banned. Importing of foreign goods was discouraged. So a lot of the trade all had to go through Britain so to make sure that the British are collecting their taxes and getting their value for these colonies. Because at the end of the day, they are still under the control of the British Empire. But you can only push people for so long until... Um, you know, you can squeeze as much out of them as you want, but eventually seems to be a gonna... common theme across some of our episodes. <laughs> yeah, it it really does. And it's this like sitting in your ivory tower in, in London, um, and not really seeing what these colonists are facing. So like some silly things, like there was a taxing of molasses that happened and that didn't make people, that was very controversial. So like little things like that, um, that just didn't have like a huge economic impact to the colonies, But the political friction it created was huge just because of do you think this entity across the the ocean is making these little calls about how you govern yourself. And it is a very American concept of like you want to be self-governing, especially today we see with like different states want, you know, don't want to have the influence of the federal government as much, let alone a king in another country that's, you know, many days away um, by boat. So definitely some some friction is starting but then a war does break out um the seven years war between the british and the french um and so what happens during this time is the F- british move into canada and they take quebec and a bunch of other french occupied territories and then they also move into native lands that were allied with the french the british have a victory and they take over a huge chunk of canada and parts of um the the americas and so this war ends but a lot of historians say the American Revolution kind of comes as an aftermath of this North American conflict. So like as we talked about many times, war is very expensive. War takes a human toll. So there's definitely some fatigue um, coming out from a lot of these colonists because these colonists are being called to fight as well. This is, again, they are still under con- the control of the British crown. So they need to step up and fight when when the call does come. So the war does end. Um, but then there's some some more of these taxes that start to come in. So there's something called the Stamp Act um, led to direct taxes on the colonies. So there were, col- there were arguments that the colonists were paying too little taxes compared to the British mainland, which in fact they were. But the colonists argued that they had no representation in the British Parliament. So they're like, we don't really care what the taxes are. But if you're making decisions and nobody here has a say in what those decisions are, that's unfair and unjust. And the, the famous quote no taxation without representation is this famous saying that went around throughout the colonies leading up to the American Revolution. So basically, though, the British saw this as something different. So they looked at um, the out- outcome of the Seven Years' War, and they had about 1,500 politically well-connected British army officers that they had to do something with. So they fought this war against the French. They won. They're very well-connected. They're very rich but they got to do something with them. And the decision was made to keep them in active duty with full pay. But the the thing was, for whatever reason, in Britain at the time, having a big standing army during peacetime in Britain was not seen as politically favorable. So they decided to stick them in the Americas and then make the colonists pay for it. And now the colonists are saying like, why do we why do we have to pay these 1500 officers? They have nothing to do with them. Again, they still, these colonists are starting to feel that friction between Britain and almost not even considering themselves British in a sense and almost seeing themselves as Americans by this point. So to get all these guys show up and be like, pay their, you know, pay their wages, 
for whatever reason. Yeah, again, for was whatever not something... reason, right? Yeah. Like, for what? What are we paying and there's, for? And there was no threat to the, the colonists at this time. The French had been defeated. Um, the Native American tribes that were in the area that had allied with the French had been pushed back. There really wasn't a huge threat that the colonists couldn't handle themselves. So they just didn't really see what the point was. But again, one more, you know, it's this, it's like a death by a thousand cuts. These little taxes come in, these little small moves by the British government continue to happen. So like there's more taxes coming in, paper, glass, and tea were all taxed. Um, and the British government argued that the colonies were legally British corporations subordinate to the British parliament. And they pointed to numerous instances where the parliament had made laws in the past that were binding on the colonies. So they're saying, look, we've made laws in the past that were binding in the colonies. We have a right to create taxes. They're all laws. So it's starting again, more of these cuts are starting to happen. So Benjamin Franklin um, makes a case basically saying that, look, the colonists have spent a lot of manpower, money and blood defending the empire. Again, the seven years war happened in North America. A lot of blood was spilled. You know, why are you taxing these people? They've given so much for the British empire. They should be given a break. And if you keep doing this, there might be a rebellion, um, which is an know, important sentiment, though, right? Yeah. Like, I think that's a very powerful one. So as I was doing my research and I was bored the other night, I watched The Patriot with Mel Gibson. And then there was a scene in that a movie where they're calling to kind of unify against um, the British. And then, you know, one of the, the background actors is having a speech and he says, I lost my leg for the king. What does he do me? What does he do for me? He taxes me more. What was the point of all this, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, it's it's a, a powerful sentiment right there. You know, these people, some of them have fought on behalf of the king and 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 for Britain. And what are they getting out of it? Seemingly, they're just getting taxed, you know, for no reason. Yeah, and if, if we look back at our previous episodes when we talked about ancient Rome, right, and we looked at all of these generals who brought all of these soldiers to various parts of of Europe and the Mediterranean and said, come with me and you will be rich. If you fight for me, you will be rich. Imagine they went and did that. And then they, and then the general turned around and said, okay, thank you for fighting. Now pay me some taxes, right? <laughs> gotcha. It's a very weird sentiment, right? Of like you given up some part of your life um, to the British empire and you're going to get taxed for it. Now, again, there's a lot of political movement here on like, sure. this is a one issue. And as some historians still argue that these taxes, again, were, were not to the level that the colonists made it out to be, but it was the principle um, that they were so against. And I do think it is a very, if we look at where America is today, it is a very American kind of view of not just no taxes, but like, give us a say in what we do. I want to be able to you know decide what my family does, what my state does, what my city does. Um, and it's something that's continued, I think, since this moment all the way up to today, which is really interesting after how long this, the country's been around that a lot of these mm -hmm. themes um, still continue. So got to a point where, you know, Benjamin Franklin's saying, we've got to be careful here. Something's going to happen potentially when it comes to a rebellion. So the first piece is in on March 5th, 1770, a large crowd gathered around a group of British soldiers soldiers um, on a Boston street. The crowd grew, getting angry, throwing rocks, snowballs, debris at them. One soldier was clubbed and fell. There was no order to fire, but the soldiers panicked and fired into the crowd. They hit 11 people. Three civilians died of wounds. Two died shortly after. And again, in this whole fanfare of everything going on, this was titled The Boston Massacre, which was new for me because... You said about the Boston Massacre. I didn't realize yeah. how small scale it actually was. I, I thought it was many more people were killed. But again, this is, you know, soldiers, the imperial might of the king, you know, putting their will on regular everyday people. And really poor optics. Really, exactly, really poor right. optics. Nobody could have died in this situation. And I still think it would have been a huge deal because soldiers firing on the citizens that are paying their taxes and, and all yeah. this kind of stuff. It's it's a very interesting kind of sentiment and again it just starts to lead to this downward spiral of the of britain and specifically this stage the province of of massachusetts so a few more years go by and then again things are just spiraling to become worse and worse um and in 1773 a group of men uh, led by samuel adams um dressed as indigenous people and boarded ships of the east india company and what they did was they dumped ten thousand pounds worth of tea into the boston harbor which equates to 636 thousand pounds today so quite a bit of tea and decades wow. later this was known as the boston tea party but one thing we know about the british is you don't mess with their tea because they're going to get very <laughs> very angry and so what the british did as a result they closed the port of boston and said we will not open the port until you pay back every penny that the 
East India um, tea company lost. So obviously not very happy about this. Um, again, things start to spiral. And about uh, just over a year later, this, the province of Massachusetts declares a full-on state of rebellion. The other colonies start to come together. And by July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is signed, basically declaring that the 13 colonies regard themselves as independent sovereign states, no longer subject to British colonial rule, thus starting the American Revolution. So this whole piece of, and I think it's going to be important when we get to Washington and his decision of this king and this imperial power doing basically whatever they want unchecked where and then the people have no say over anything that the king and the british government is doing really comes all together into why they're actually fighting this war and we can talk and we'll see a little bit more of why washington makes his decision or is really based on some of these core principles so i think richie maybe that's a a good starting point for us to to bring washington on the scene as the american revolution kicks into high gear here yeah definitely i think this is a great time to kind of do a bit of a bio on our friend George Washington. So Paul, as you had alluded earlier, um, so he, George Washington from 1732 to 1799, his lifespan, he was the first U S president, a founding father, commander in chief of the continental army during the American revolution. You know, he is still, um, held in very high regard in, in relation to his leadership skills, his integrity, his commitment to national unity, as he established the foundation for the United States. Post presidency, you know, he did return to Mount Vernon and obviously set a precedent for peaceful transitions of power that we'll kind of dive into a little bit later. Uh, in terms of his early life, so we'll jump into it from, you know, his time as a child and we'll work all the way up to the point at which we're most concerned about. So he was born on February 22nd, 1732, in Westmoreland County, Virginia, to Augustine Washington and Mary Ball Washington. He was the eldest of six siblings. His education focused primarily on mathematics, surveying, and the classics. Uh, he didn't really attend college, but his education had prepped him for a career in surveying and land management. It's kind of unique. It's not something that you typically hear about when it comes to the more classical education that we typically have kind of covered uh, on the podcast so far. Yeah, definitely. It's this, again, this colonial world, too, that's just so new. And the classic, you know, British way of doing things or some of those more traditional ways really hasn't made its way over um, mm -hmm. in a widespread way like it may have in, you know, if we were looking a hundred years later. So yeah, it's, I think like talk about surveying, it's just, you know, what we think, I think education is supposed to be, what can I do to get a job and be, you know, useful in my community. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think it, it kind of worked out for, I guess, for him in that sense of, I would imagine that's probably where some of that came into play. Agreed. Yeah. So like following the death of his half brother in 1752, Washington inherited the Mount Vernon estate, which would become his home for the remainder of his life. He expanded and continued to develop it throughout his career and, you know, over the longevity of his life. The, inter the interesting thing about his career as a surveyor, obviously, it brought him into contact with very prominent landowners and government officials, which obviously would later help him kind of secure these influential positions. Um, we pivot now to, you know, the onset of his military career. So I know we had just kind of discussed the seven years war, I guess, you know, in terms of when I was doing the research, the French and Indian war kept kind of coming out as a, as a main kind of point of, of discussion. And it's interesting in the research, people were kind of synonymously using the French and Indian war as the seven years war. So I wasn't entirely sure if they were one and the same thing, or, you know, one was a part of the other. Um, but from what I was able to kind of parse out, the French and Indian War was the North American theater of the broader Seven Years' War between Great Britain and France. And this is where Washington's military career essentially began. So he was appointed as the official surveyor of Culpeper County and later commissioned as a major in the Virginia militia in 1754. He led an expedition against the French, which resulted in the Battle of Jumonville Glen and the subsequent Battle of Fort Necessity, making the beginning of the French and Indian War. He later served as an aide to a British general, Edward Bradcock, and eventually promoted to the rank of colonel, commanding the Virginia Regiment. So you can already see, you know, in a very short period of time, he's able to successfully support the military effort and raise in the ranks, you know, quite swiftly by aligning himself with the right people and providing, you know, the um, 
the sources that he needed to do. So we can jump into his political career. So this kind of covers the pre-revolutionary period from 1758 to 1774. So he's elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses, which he represented the Frederick County. During this period, he became increasingly disillusioned with British policies towards the American colonies. And again, the main focus being the issues related to taxation and representation. He was an influential voice against the British Stamp Act and other perceived injustices. And this kind of takes us to the Revolu Revolutionary War and kind of his broader leadership in 17, from 1775 to 1783. So he's elected as the delegate to the First and Second Continental Congresses, representing Virginia. In 1775, he was unanimously appointed as the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, despite facing numerous challenges. Uh, including supply shortages, low morale, strategic setbacks. His leadership was instrumental in securing American independence. Uh, his most notable victories include the Battles of Trenton, Saratoga, and the ultimate triumph at Yorktown in 1781. So I don't know what you found from your research, uh, Richie, but like from what I was reading about him as a general, it was kind of a, ver a lot of just like, meh, he was okay. Like he wasn't anything special, but to your point of... He was really this great leader um, and ability to bring people together. But from like a tactical standpoint, there really wasn't much to write home about. I don't know if you kind of saw, read the same stuff. Yeah. So I listened to a BBC podcast on this exact topic about how influential he was to the war effort. I think one of the historians went as far as to say, like, they probably would have won even without Washington oh, just wow. because they had so many other skillful tacticians, both on the American and French side. Um, right. during the revolution so that like tactically speaking we don't you know they didn't actually put a lot of emphasis on how important washington was from a strategic side but right. i think my takeaway from that conversation was that he was this kind of unifying symbol and persona that people kind of gravitated to given his charisma his leadership skill and the sense of duty that kind of propelled him into the positions that he did I don't know how you measure that. <laughs> so, you know, it's yeah. kind of difficult that way. But from a, like a military tactician, strategic perspective, it seems like nothing to write home about. And uh, that that's kind of what the, the, my sense was after kind of doing some research. Yeah, it's interesting with like we talk about the French being involved in the British, like these professional armies as well. And I think the level of like tactical genius that you could have with essentially bunch of militiamen versus a professional army i don't know how effective that's going to be versus someone who's able to bring the morale and you know drive of all of these people um on the american side because there was a quote i saw somebody said the american tr some american troops were meeting with some french troops and they the american troop asked the f one of the french um troops you know what do you do for a living like what's your job back home and the french soldier laughed at him saying what do you what do you mean like I'm, I'm a soldier and then you know they're all like oh i'm a farmer i'm you know i'm, I'm a merchant and you know all of these different things so it's it is interesting to just think of this traditional like when i think of like great you know generals you think of like a julius caesar and napoleon leading these really strong professional armies to what washington really had to lead was essentially just a bunch of militia poorly trained young men who but we're all fighting for something versus, you know, a paycheck or something like that, which is interesting because like you talked about how do you measure that? I wonder in a situation like this, does this mean a little bit more because it isn't at that as a professional of an army and they are really what's going to get them to win is that drive and that will and that I guess like they don't want to surrender or like it's going to take a lot for them to, you know, break rank and stuff like that. So I don't know. I think it's just an interesting point as you were talking there that kind of just popped into my head. No, I agree, though, right? I think this is kind of the conversation we had with Joan of Arc. Mm -hmm. You know, the power of an idea or a symbol and the right. social contagion that can kind of spread because of that. Yeah, it's interesting, like, the break from tradition here, right? Like, we have farmers and candle makers and, yeah. you know, <laughs> whatever other professions. Uh, I'm not familiar with them from this particular era who mm -hmm. have signed up to fight because they're motivated um, by this kind of ideal of unity and, you know, this right. idea of what America is and what it, what it means to them. Um, and sometimes I think, you know, like that's a very powerful thing. I don't know how you measure it, but I think there are examples throughout history where, groups of people have kind of self-organized around this idea and have overcome tremendous 
uphill battles to to ultimately succeed and i think you know this is one of those definitely yeah and it's interesting with like just thinking of the british entering this war and you're having a lot of fighting against professional armies whether it's the french or the spanish or whatever the heck else was going on in europe at the time to come up Mm -hmm. against essentially a ragtag group of guys literally ragtag great word great word and it's they're probably thinking hey this might be a, a walk in the park which obviously it isn't for them but yeah, it's just an interesting kind of sentiment that I was thinking of is how different this is and what type of leader like may succeed or may not succeed. Like I think if you do you stick Napoleon in charge of the American army and maybe he still figures it out because he is so smart, but sure. he doesn't have a, as much of maybe as a well-disciplined, tr- well-trained army, does things change or does he are you able to adapt? I don't know. I think it's something that interesting that we can maybe explore a bit more as we start to look at some different generals throughout history. I think it definitely kind of adds to this myth of American exceptionalism. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? Like it is yeah. quite a powerful sentiment and symbol that I think is still deeply entrenched in this kind of broader narrative of American independence and, and American identity that these kind of ragtag guys showed up, <laughs> grouped together and beat, you know, and pushed back a global empire because you know they were able to form so yeah i think that's it's actually i didn't think about it that way until now but it is it is quite exceptional and extraordinary yeah definitely so we jump into the revolutionary war a little bit because i think this is where you know we really get into the meat of things um so the revolutionary war also known as the american war of independence was a conflict between great britain and the 13 north american colonies um when they had declared themselves as the independent united states of america the war took place from 1775 to 1783 and was fought to kind of determine broader political, economic, and social futures of the American colonies. The conflict, like we said, was sparked by growing tensions between the colonies and Britain over issues of taxation, representation, self-governance. Washington played a pivotal role in the Revolutionary War as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. This was the United Military Forces of the 13 colonies. He was appointed to this position by the Second Continental Congress in in 1775, and he led the army throughout the entirety of the war. During the war, um, you know, I think his career, his military career, at least in this chapter, was marked by both setbacks and triumphs. His first major challenge was the siege of Boston where he successfully forced the British to evacuate the city in 1776. Uh, Later that year, he faced a series of defeats around New York City, but he managed to regroup and secure a critical victory at the Battle of Trenton on December 26, 1776, which boosted the morale of the Continental Army and the American public. And then, you know, throughout the war, more broadly speaking, he did demonstrate some exceptional strategic and tactical skills, um, as well as what I would probably consider the more important ability of motivating and inspiring his troops he faced numerous challenges supply shortages super harsh winters again low morale among the soldiers despite these obstacles he continued to persevere and adapted his strategies as he needed his most significant military victory came in 1781 at the battle of yorktown where his forces aided by the french army under general rochambeau and the french fleet commanded by admiral de grasse trapped in forces surrender of the british general cornwallis The victory effectively ended the Revolutionary War and paved the way for the negotiation of the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which formally recognized the United States as an independent nation. In summary, I think it's hard to deny the impact Washington had. He seems like he is very much a pivotal figure, you know, during the Revolutionary War and really aided and, you know, was influential in the in the ultimate result of winning it. I think what Washington brings to the table that's so different is just where he's from. I think being from Virginia is just so key because it is almost seen as like you're not in the north, you're not in the south, you're just right in the middle, and you can bring everybody together in this sense, and so you're not feeling like a southerner, oh, I'm fighting for a northerner, or I'm a northerner fighting for a southerner. You're fighting for this guy from Virginia who's like, you maybe don't even really know where he belongs on the north-south kind of split, and I think that's that's so important and i think there's another story too where he's the continental army basically like by by law they could leave after a certain amount of time and washington has to get them to to re-up and he just is able to give you know this really great speech where he really focuses on you know you're going to be remembered by 
Americans, not just today, but for the rest of time and to allow everybody to have this wonderful life that you're fighting for and is able to get everybody to sign back up again, even though they could have left and gone home if they really wanted to without any legal repercussions. And so to be able to do that, like, again, the idea is there, but even if he's, and if he isn't objectively this brilliant tactician, he's got to be able to bring people together in some way. And so I think we talked about, yeah, maybe he wasn't the best tactician. Maybe they would have won anyways without him. Maybe they would have won, but with the army of stayed together, I think that's a question that's really up for debate. Good and I question. think that's where yep. I think we have to look at Washington is why he's so, so important to this story. And as we'll start to see as, okay, we've won the war, but now we have to build a nation, which arguably might be the harder of the two, two things here. So it's that, I think, unification piece. And let's go all the way back to episode one, when we talked about Sir John A. Macdonald, these first leaders of these new countries, unification, bringing people together. It's a theme that will... Again, we're going to keep seeing it, but I think it just kind of comes to the to the top here, you know, once again. Yeah, you read my mind, Paul. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I was definitely <laughs> going to go back there. Um, I think when it comes to this idea of like nation making, which is what we're seeing here, one of the things that I kind of came across while I was doing my research, I think it was the same BBC podcast I listened to, where, you know, they're trying to organize these these groups of men from these 13 distinct and separate colonies. So, you know, often we talk about regionalism, at, at least in the Canadian context, you know, these kind of, you know, we talk about how provinces are different from one another and we have this kind of provincial identity. Well, you kind of have this colonial identity that isn't shared across the other 12 colonies that you might be coming from. And then you're trying to organize them under the banner of this idea of the United States of America. And I was like, what is that? You know, like I come from this colony, you come from that colony. We harvest different crops. Our culture is a little bit different. But we talk is a bit different. You know, how, what do I have in common with you? And why should I fight beside you? It's really powerful when someone can kind of galvanize these very distinct group, or at least groups who see themselves as distinct from one another under this banner of, you know, the United States of America. Definitely. And I think it may be a good time to pivot here into like this idea we talk about, because I think it's so important that, you know, like you were saying with Washington and this idea is so great and everybody's behind it, but we see with any ideas, there can be small little changes here and there, different interpretations. And I think Washington being that glue is important, but I think the ultimate piece we need to just maybe talk about a little bit is this idea of what America really stands to be and just how radically different it is from what's seen anywhere really in the world at the time. So the constitution that was created for the United States introduced um, a no really new um, doctrine on how governments will work. So it had things like checks and balances, separating, separating of powers between the branches, and really just didn't have this one ultimate authority figure. We, there was no nobility, there was no clergy. And I think those two pieces, like we say today, look, of course, the people are in charge. That's what a democracy is. But this is a very, very new concept. Like this is a concept that's, you know, maybe talked about through intellectuals in, in Britain. But nobody thinks practically this could ever work because it's not something that's ever yeah. been tried and ever been been done. And we've looked like, you know, we talked about Joan of Arc and, you know, she was born into France as a woman with no nobility and not part of the clergy. There's no path for her outside of being an unbelievable leader that got probably very lucky and very fortunate, but also was just yeah. almost superhuman in her talents. That non-defined path doesn't really exist in the United States. It is, you can make your own path to an extent, and that definitely changes over time. It's definitely for sure. men who are white to start with. And then that eventually evolves as, as time goes on. And another thing that they did too, is they made the constitution a living document. So if the people decided that they wanted to make a change, they can make a change. This wasn't like set in stone and it will forever be this document. It can, you know, live and breathe. And so it's this change of just non-centralized power, non your birthright doesn't mean what it used to mean back in Europe. And it's this novel concept where now you are a soldier fighting on the front line and you theoretically could be president of the United States one day. You could be a senator. You could be a governor of your state or you could run a successful business. All of these things are now possible where pretty much anywhere else in the world, it's almost impossible unless you have some sort of birthright to it. And so it's a, just a radical, radical change from anything that the world is seeing. And even the French, apparently, from what I was reading, we're so convinced that this just was not going to work that their whole <laughs> thought was, 
okay, well, we'll support these American rebels in their fight against England or Britain because we don't like Britain, therefore anybody, enemy of my enemy is my sure. friend. Yep. But when you know America becomes its own country and then it all falls apart because this will never work, we'll come in and mop up and get some of our territory back. Nobody thought this was going to work. And look where it's where it got to, right? It's not just some country. It is probably the most powerful country in the world to today. So it's a, a fascinating change in what was the norm at the time and just very, very unlikely. And again, we probably have to go back to Washington as well and really having some sort of glue to help with that nation building process. Well, it's also, it's kind of ironic though, right? Like the, the French not believing in it <laughs> yeah. while the Americans are kind of taking the these enlightenment radical ideas that have you know moved over the atlantic you know they're they're quoting french writers english writers to right. kind of help stand up this this idea of independence and and then the declaration of independence um so I, I just find that's kind of funny they're like yeah you know i we know what we said but <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then the french are in for a rude awakening i think what the french revolution is like 30 40 years after that something like yeah. that yeah so you know Definitely big, big changes are coming across the world, but definitely starts in America. But you're right. There's a lot of irony in, in everything that was said there. So I think we can probably jump back into like the post-war period um, right. and the Constitutional Convention that happens from 1783 to 1789. So um, Washington at this point has resigned his military commission in 1783. He's returned to Mount Vernon and he's kind of focused on his estate. I think he clearly just wants to take a step back uh, from political and military life. Um, however, short-lived, <laughs> he's soon called back to public service. He attends the Constitutional Convention in 1787, and uh, he's elected the president of the convention and plays a crucial role in the development and ratification of the United States Constitution. And I think it's interesting, too, with his non-formal education, where he's dealing with these essentially juggernauts of literary skill and law and all of these things like Jefferson and Adams and those guys to have a guy who's not really on their level when it comes to, you know, maybe an intellectual um, standpoint to be still be elected president. Again, it does tell you that there was something with this guy that was able to bring things together. And I think we'll get into it a little bit, but I think it's just something to just really double down on that. He is outside the norm. I think a little bit on what we're seeing from who's going to be involved in founding this nation and then who against, you know, they were fighting against it's almost like this kind of weird sweet spot that he kind of finds himself in. And I think it's just something to keep thinking about when we talk about Washington. Maybe we get into his character traits a little bit more. Yeah, I think he like embodies kind of the everyman, right? Or like this ideal everyman that's kind of led by civic duty and, and virtue and, and strong leadership skills. You know, it, it's <laughs> there's a lot of current <laughs> examples yeah. of that. Some not so nice, some, some nice, <laughs> where, you know, I think sometimes intellectuals to their own to their own downfall aren't as accessible or relatable right mm. and i think you have washington who obviously he's educated but he doesn't have a formal you know very high degree of education and he's kind of worked his way up through the ranks right like he's kind of built this estate his legacy for himself and i think there's a kind of mythology and story and relatability about that. And then mm -hmm. we'll get into his characteristics. But I think, yeah, there's definitely something very powerful there and a bit of a pattern, I think, that we can probably see across other um, periods of time, regions, even this region that we're talking <laughs> about today, <laughs> in terms of how that kind of uh, meshes with people very well. Yeah, and I think even I was reading something about the Congress or when he was elected at the convention for the first time, like he barely spoke. He came up and he, I think he like, basically came in and said, yeah, this is what's going on. And, you know, saying a few things and then some people were getting rowdy. So he had to tell them to calm down. But think of a convention today, you know, it's Biden and Obama and Trump and Bush coming up and having these grand speeches and everybody going crazy and saying, this is our leader. For him, it was, I'm just going to sit and I'm going to let what this convention needs to do. Each person is who they are. We're going to talk through some logistical things and he's going to have his opinion. But I think it's just so profound on how someone can ha be at the height of, you know, leading an army, give it up and then come back and just say, we want you to be president. And he goes, great. I'm going to sit back and I'm going to listen. I'm not going to yeah. make a big speech. 
it's absolutely insane when you really think about it. And there's a, a interesting story about, you know, what he, when he became president, what that actually meant. So I love this story of when they talked about what were they actually going to call the president? That was like a big thing. Was oh, it? Okay. There's, so they said, we got to call you something. And um, <laughs> Vice President Adams said, well, we should call you his elective majesty or the <laughs> or his mightiness or his highness, the president of the United States of America and protector of liberties. Those were all things that were brought up. <laughs> what a and, handle. <laughs> and they were like, Mr. Washington, which which one do you prefer? And so Washington is so smart and he realizes everything that he does is going to set a precedent for the future of this country. So he doesn't like any of these things. And he says, no, I'll just go with Mr. President. Very simple, very clean. And very new. He, he, again, he doesn't want this position to be this king and this mighty ruler. It's just a guy who has a lot of power, but he ultimately says he's the president. And the most one of something that's super interesting is what the word president actually means. So like growing up, I always thought of president, ultimate power, decision maker, commander in chief. That's what a president is. But when you look at its true definition, it really just means to preside over like a meeting or an assembly Mm -hmm. you are there to preside to guide to make sure everything is working well but not even to lead and so i think it's just such an interesting piece on what america actually stood for but how washington really understood that it's not his job to be this great leader it's his job to make sure that government runs well to settle disputes to guide and everybody together and to be that glue that really that if we want Georgia and and Massachusetts to get along, there's going to need to be some glue in between that. And that's really what it comes back to. And again, it goes to his character of all of these other leaders that may have existed over time really wanted this level of power. But for Washington, it was Mr. President. I'm here to preside. I'm here to guide. I'm here to teach, but I'm not here to rule. And I'm not here to be the ultimate decision maker, which I think again is America should be what America is in a nutshell. You can, make some arguments one way or another how things have <laughs> changed over the years but really at the time it's it is such a novel concept and i think washington plays a huge role in all of that well it's funny right those titles that they kind of provided him as examples have a very uh <laughs> yeah regal monarchical european british kind of flair to them right yeah. which again I- ironic to say the least but you got to give it up to, to Mr. Washington for having some foresight to understand that he's setting a, you know, hopefully setting a president that's going to be followed for years, if not centuries uh, to come. So we can jump into his presidency quickly. So he was unanimously elected the first president of the United States in 1789. He served two terms uh, until 1797. He focused on establishing a very strong, stable and financially secure nation. Some of his key achievements focused on establishment of the federal judiciary system, the creation of a national bank, and the implementation of economic policies that were largely kind of uh, framed by Alexander Hamilton. I think, you know, this is probably two big takeaways that we kind of centered our conversation around, and they are related, one being the Constitution, and the second being this idea of a civil-controlled army that was there to represent public interest versus the interest of the powers that be. And I think it goes back to it to remind people that America is a republic. This is, a, again, yes. and not a new concept, but it's something that really has you know died off and failed so many times. And so I think, again, the comparison to our ancient Rome episodes of Rome being a republic, um, we look at the time of Hannibal, Rome was a republic, the, the armies were in command of the consuls for the year, but they were elected by the Senate and the people. And it really was a semi uh, controlled or civilian controlled um, army versus a Republic moving into an empire with an ultimate commander at the top. And I think that's is what a lot of people looked at was also the Republic. It's going to fail. They always fail. They always turn into empire. Somebody gets greedy. And so I think like you're saying, Washington giving back this, giving back the army is I think a huge, huge piece because it really doesn't really happen very often, and if at all. And there's so many examples of some some of the good thing is happening, and then a, a really powerful general says, this is a great opportunity for me to, to seize power. And so, yeah. yeah. So maybe I'll give a, a few examples for the listeners here just to give an idea of, like, why does this matter? Like, of course he gave back the army to 
to the people like that or to Congress. It seems so obvious, right? right? It seems like the right thing to do. But again, you know, history tells us otherwise. (laughs) Exactly. So here's a, here's a few examples. So let's go back to, to ancient Rome and really the ending of the Roman Republic and moving into an empire is, you know, Julius Caesar, he conquered Gaul, um, uh, which is modern day France, refused to give up his consulship, marched his army to Rome um, and declared himself dictator for life. He was eventually assassinated, and then his nephew um, Octavian becomes Emperor Augustus and the first emperor of Rome. So this is an example of Julius Caesar conquered Gaul. His consulship was up. His job was to give the army back to the people. Whoever the next consul is would take over that army, but he didn't want to do that. There's obviously some political reasons for that, but ultimately he didn't do it. Napoleon is another example, became the first consulate of the French Republic, but slowing political turmoil there was some assassinations attempt um and then part of it was he created and he wanted to justify creating a new constitution um which ultimately gave his family ultimate control again which is that very whole thing we've just talked about is nobility and birthright um and so essentially moving the front the short-lived french republic back into you know calling it an empire but really to what it was before with nobility and you know birthright meaning so much and then uh, Simon Bolivier from South America. So he was a huge part of liberating parts of South America from Spanish rule. And eventually he becomes dictator for life um, in some areas. He ended up dying in office as a dictator for life. Um, but the one kind of key thing I think here that's a little bit different is none of them really had Washington's political stability. Um, a lot of them, like Simon Bolivier, there was a lot of conflict going on down there and there's the argument that could be made that if he didn't take ultimate power, someone else would, um, ruining kind of everything that they did. Julius Caesar, you can maybe make that argument. Napoleon, maybe not as much. Um, but again, this precedent has been set. Great general, great power, new, new nation state. You take over and you seize power for yourself and ultimately your family. So I think it is like this, like the way we could think about this is Washington, the war ends. The Congress goes, give us back the army. He goes, eh, I don't think I'm going to do that. I'm going to put myself in charge. And then I'm going to make the Constitution say Washington and all of Washington's family, you know, will take over and my son will be, you know, president or emperor number two. It is really just a stark contrast to really what happened. But again, that was the precedent at the time. So I think it is really a really great moment. But I'm curious, Richie, like, is there anything that jumps out to you from maybe your research on why he would make a decision like this? Was it purely just, this is what he was fighting for? Or do you think maybe there's a little bit more to that? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, it's cause it, to your previous point, like it seems so obvious, right? The war is over. What am I going to do with the military? Have it back. Right. But like, that's a very novel way to think in this point in time across what's happening, you know, in, in different areas. Or, or similar kind of scenarios where people are just kind of like, yeah, I'm gonna, actually going to keep control because it's in my best interest and the best interest of the people I care about and we're going to maintain power. With Washington, and I think this kind of loops back to our, our com- couple of our ri- initial talking points is that I'm sure he was ambitious, but his ambition was not his main driver. Neither was this kind of idea of empowering himself or you know great fortune, wealth, and you know authority i think the thing that sets him apart and really kind of stood out to me um was this kind of idea of like civic duty the sense of duty you know he felt a strong sense of responsibility towards his country and fellow citizens and i think you know based on something that i read it was this kind of idea that he was often reluctant reluctant to accept positions of power but did so out of a sense of duty rather than ambition Mm. And after his presidency, he willingly relinquished power and returned to private life, setting a precedent for future presidents. So like this kind of peaceful transition of power is what what we see today in many modern democracies, or at least, you know, we hope to. And I think that's probably the one major kind of characteristic that stood out for me. And then, you know, I think when you compound that with he seems to be a man of very high integrity, right? Like he valued honesty, transparency which allowed him to earn the trust of his fellow countrymen. He was known to be a man of his word and believed in keeping his personal professional life separate. He refused gifts and favors to maintain his impartiality. Like he just seems like a, a person of very high morale and character. 
And I think the two things that set him apart as to why he would think and act this way would be his sense of duty, his integrity, his leadership. He obviously had a lot of humility. <laughs> you know, there's like <laughs> a lot of great characteristics the more we talk about George Washington, you know, and vision, right? Like this is something that's come across, I think, probably the majority of our episodes so far, but like the foresight, the vision to understand yep. that what he's doing, if all goes well, is going to set the precedent for future elected officials. Mm-hmm. And I think I think that's a really powerful thing, right? Because everyone else could be thinking within you know, much shorter time frames, much shorter perspectives. But here he is thinking very long term. Exactly how long term? Who knows, right? He doesn't know how, what America is going to turn out like. But yeah, enough foresight to kind of see that his decisions that are made today, if all goes well, will impact future generations. Definitely. And I, I wonder, too, like you talk about legacy. It's like the legacy of the country, the legacy of everything that America will become versus like his personal legacy. And I, I'd be interested to like get inside his head. And I wonder how he balanced the two. I wonder if he was very like, I want this legacy of myself to be of the person who set America on the right path. And that's why I'm doing this. Or I want the legacy of what everything that all of my soldiers fought for and all of us founding fathers worked towards to be this great nation. And I'm sure there's a bit of both. Cause I sure. think at any t- any time in history, someone's got to be thinking about their legacy, but I don't know. It's, it's a, I th- like I try to keep going back to what if he did, like, what if he did what Julius Caesar did and, and took over a, I don't, was it even possible with the way his um, army was built? Like, I don't think they would fight for him, but it would just be so out of character. Like it's not even something my mind can rationalize um, as I go through it. Um, but I think you're right. Like that level of duty, um, that level of humility and that civic duty element as well. It's just, it's so profound and just so strong. It kind of, you can see, I'm see it like oozing out of Washington. It's like, this is my yeah. job. I will do what my job is because it's my duty. And when I'm done with it, I'll do something else. And if you need me, you know, give me a call. But it yeah. is just kind of, it's a simple sort of way of just kind of looking at it. And it's, it's just something different that the world really hadn't seen too much of. And it really becomes a staple of what it means to be American in terms of, you know, civic duty. And we look at, again, someone like Truman and even Lincoln. It's like, this was their job to think about the foresight of the future of the country, but also to lead when called upon, not to necessarily say, I want to be the leader the, and the ultimate decision maker for personal gain, which is totally different than the majority of leaders, you know, we've talked about here and probably we'll talk about as we move along. I think that's what makes the conversation so interesting though, right? Like when we look at our modern political landscape and, you know, there's many drawbacks and pitfalls. And then we do this kind of, uh, historical comparison and we look at these great leaders you know we're talking about washington right now but you mentioned truman you mentioned lincoln this kind of idea that sure they want power but their priorities and their motivators are much different it's not just power for the sake of power um right. they're they're doing it because they have some sort of ambition or larger goal that is much bigger than their own perceived authority and success and I think right. that's why these characters are so interesting and, you know, almost magnetic in a way that we talk about them. And we often like some of the character characteristics we've talked about about Washington, you know, we could easily be talking about Lincoln or Truman right now if someone just heard right. that section of the podcast. So it definitely goes to show that there are some shared characteristics amongst leaders and these kind of decision makers that we spoke focused on thus far. Definitely. And something that just came up as you were speaking, I thought of was this need to lead to accomplish that sense of duty, not necessarily I for anything other than this is a a way to justify getting something done for Lincoln, getting rid of slavery for Washington, building a nation. All of these things come together as to enable to to be able to do what they needed to do. They needed to be a leader, not necessarily I have this massive ego and I'll have everybody singing my praises and that's what I want. And then if I can accomplish something, that's also great too. Yes. It's yep. totally a different contrast. So yeah, I think it's something special we're seeing here with, with Washington and again, the precedent of all the things that he set, but also the precedent of how a leader should act, I think is something that, you know, you can see why all these presidential candidates and stuff will always talk about George Washington and, you know, the founding fathers and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's an interesting piece. And I think it really goes into a very interesting legacy that uh, we can see with Washington. 
Yeah, I think just to maybe close the loop on this, and I don't know how you felt, but it almost felt like he was too good. You know what I mean? Like, there's yeah. like all the great characteristics. I'm like, there's got to be something wrong with this guy. Like, it's so yeah. hard to pin down because <laughs> I, even for me, you know, reading about him, learning about him, prepping for this podcast, I was like, okay, like, come on, he can't be this good. There's got to be something. Like, yeah. how do you become the president just being authentic and genuine and, and propelled through a sense <laughs> of civic duty? Is that all it takes? You know, very hard to come to terms with when you when we compare it to what we see or what we've lived through. And kind of trying to pin down this kind of uh, archetype that he is. And I did a quick kind of search to understand how historians have kind of viewed him. Because I'm like, if I'm struggling to pin this down, I'm, I'm very curious to see what professional historians do, right? And, you know, to their credit, he has evolved in terms of how he's kind of seen, understood, and interpreted as this kind of historical figure. So early biographers of him portrayed him as this kind of heroic leader, Washington as this kind of larger-than-life figure, a symbol of the nation's founding principles, you know, kind of what we're talking about, this paragon of virtue. And then as we kind of move forward, more progressive historians in the early 20th century see him as an economic motivator. Like many of the other founding fathers, they were primarily driven by economic motivation seeking to protect their own wealth and property. I don't necessarily buy that analysis, but it seemed <laughs> to have some popularity in the early 20th century. <laughs> then you have this kind of evolution to what's been termed as like this idea of a pragmatic statesman, highlighting Washington's pragmatism, focusing on his ability to balance competing interests, avoid entanglements in European conflicts, and foster national unity. So again, we're kind of returning to that original kind of analysis, right? And then as we move forward, you have this idea of him being this kind of complex figure. Historians start delving into the contradictions of his life, you know, particularly in relation to slavery. You know, how they explored Washington's role as a slave owner, examined tensions between his commitment to liberty and his, and his kind of participation in the institution of slavery. And then finally, I think they've kind of landed on this, uh, maybe I wouldn't call it the final archetype, but the latest archetypes of like profession, prof the historical analysis, which is kind of this human leader. So mm. focused on his personal qualities, such as his humility, his sense of duty, his commitment to public service, and how they kind of argue that these traits played a significant role in his effectiveness as a leader, both during the war and as president but still trying to kind of square this whole two truths, you know, at the same time, him kind of being this formidable leader who, you know, oozes all these great virtues and characteristics while at the same time trying to reconcile this reality that he was a slave owner. I believe at any given time, I think at, at the peak, his estate had over 300 slaves. So, you know, yeah, I think he got some of those slaves in a dowry as well from his wife's family. So, yeah, I think he got yeah. the majority from his wife's dowry, actually, like or right. like 50 percent at least. It's just odd to think I, whenever I think of dowry, I think of just like a sack of gold or some cattle, but like a cow. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Here's humans to work your field for you. It's, again, a, a very bizarre concept. Well, and I think this is a good point, too, right? Like, I think we've kind of at least it seems like we have a real good sense of why he returned the Continental Army back to the civilian control. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of embodies some of the virtues and characteristics we've talked about. Um, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't touch on the conversation of racism. But I also think this is probably one of the most interesting things that I actually took away from this pot, from, from doing this research. Historically speaking, it's always difficult to not project right. current mores on historical mores. Things change, social, cultural except expectations change. But trying to understand George Washington's view towards race and racism is obviously quite difficult, but we have to understand the context in which he lived and the evolution of his views on slavery and race throughout his life. He was a product of his times. And like many of his contemporaries, he held views that would be considered racist today. He was a slave owner. He participated in the institution of slavery and at one point in time, believed in the inherent inferiority of African Americans. But it is important to note that his views on race and slavery evolved over time. During the Revolutionary War, his experiences with African American soldiers contributed to the shift in his perspective. He came to appreciate the contributions of black soldiers to the American cause and grew increasingly disillusioned 
with the institution of slavery. Um, in later years, when he became increasingly conflicted about slavery and the role it played in American society, we see his vision again in his foresight. He started expressing concerns about the future of the nation if slavery continued and it and and recognized the contradictions of the ideals of liberty and equality that the u s was founded upon while still upholding this you know institution of slavery in his will and this is where you know I was kind of blown away. He made provisions for the eventual emancipation of the slave slaves after his wife's death and provided for their education and support It's quite the arc you yeah. know to you start from these people are inferior because of where they're from and what they look like to you should be free and you should be given a head, you know, a head start over, you know, other free people. It's quite, it's quite the arc, but it's also so radical for the time as well. Like I think we look at a lot of the founding fathers and some more than others definitely had reservations about slavery and knew the contradiction that they were writing into the constitution mm -hmm. by saying, you know, in the declaration of independence, like all those things about all men being equal. <laughs> and then you have people enslaved. And I think they all knew that this was going to lead to some big, big problems down the line, which it absolutely did. But to free your slaves at that point in history, where again, the South slave economy plantations, that's, that's how everything rolls down there showing any sign of we're going to go towards emancipation could have broken apart the country a lot earlier than it did. And I think I've even seen with George Washington, him saying, you know, he doesn't, he would like to look at emancipation, but it's just, it, it wasn't his top priority for reasons of, I don't even know how I'm going to get it done. And yeah. we are, you know, our nation is still so fragile. We have to keep it together. But man, like what an arc though. I think that's just, I think that's one really great thing to take away from this is to watch how someone like him can develop on something so almost radical for the time of seeing all people created equally and that people shouldn't be enslaved, which is still so new for the time. It's definitely changing more than it maybe was a hundred years earlier, sure, yeah. but I think it has to go with, we keep talking about like, well, why did he, you know, why was he so good? Why did he do all these things? There's clearly a level where he has this openness to experience that I think probably a lot of leaders that aren't as successful as him didn't have like to be able to, learn and develop as a military leader, learn and develop as a human, and then eventually learn and develop as a statesman. I think all of these things contributed. And I think to kind of the, the arc you just described, I think shows that to a T of he's open and he's willing to learn. And he understands that he has to evolve and can't get stuck in his ways or everything he's working for, you know, isn't going, isn't going to get to where he needs it to be. So I think it's a really fascinating story. And I think it maybe unlocks a little bit of the mystery we've had about, you know, why was he so good at what he did? you know, without a formal education and, and all of these sort of things. So yeah, definitely an interesting arc. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it was interesting enough to to learn and research about his kind of thought process and his history and his background. And, you know, obviously we focused on his decision to return, you know, the Continental Army back to the colonies. Ironically, I think this was the part that really kind of blew me away, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think it speaks to his values at a much deeper level, at a much lower level, right? On the on, on a day-to-day -day kind of perspective where you can go from being a product of your times and, and believing in the inferiority of African Americans to making provisions to emancipate them all and not only emancipate them, but provide for their education and make sure they're supported after his wife's death. I think it really goes to show you how he lived the values that we were talking about earlier right. that we used to describe him. And I think that to me is probably the most powerful takeaway because mm -hmm. it just shows you how open he was to change evolution, questioning his, his, his own rationale and thought process and never being too deeply entrenched into, you know, one particular ideology, but kind of always being driven by that sense of duty to, you know, his fellow countrymen. And I think with his changing views on racism, it definitely, you know, broadened his perspective on who his countrymen were, right? And I think that right. is really a beautiful kind of takeaway as a part of this more grander narrative. Yeah, and I think... I'm thinking that might be a good place to maybe wrap it up and end. Cause I think you've, we've talked about this arc in this beautiful way of, you know, I think he's the first leader we've really seen that it's so cut and dry that he's, yeah. <laughs> we see that ability to evolve 
know, we speculate a lot of times like, oh, they were doing this and then they changed. But like, I think the way you, you kind of brought it all together really wraps up, I think puts kind of a nice bow on, on Washington's life and really stamps home this trait, we're, this leadership trait we're seeing in that ability to evolve, not get stuck in your ways, open to experience. And ultimately there's some compassion in there as well. There's, exactly. if, and I think, you know, to, to go from a general who's, you know, having to be pretty brutal at times to an ultimately very compassionate person is it's quite the arc and it's, it's quite beautiful to see. And I think, you know, Washington coming out of this for me is definitely higher than up in the list of, of great leaders than I thought he was, you know, coming in with the first with president of the United States. Yeah. You go, oh yeah, he's great. Of course, he's probably overhyped, but maybe if, honestly, he was underrated for me going after learning everything that I've learned now. And I think that that kind of story you told about him changing his ways. I think really sets him over the top. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I had a certain respect and admiration for him that has only exponentially grown since uh, doing the research. Yeah. And I think, I think um, we could probably all take a page or two out of his book without having to raise and run a continental army um, <laughs> in terms of some of the values and things that I think make people good. Definitely. All right. I think we can wrap it up from there and, uh, Thank everyone for listening and we'll uh, see you all next time. Thanks everybody. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the History in Motion podcast. If you enjoyed our journey through time, please subscribe, rate us, and share the podcast with friends. Your support helps keep history alive. Until next time.